Lord Russell, what do you mean by taboo morality? Well, I mean the sort of morality that consists in giving a set of rules, mainly as to things you must not do, without giving any reasons for those rules. And sometimes no reasons could be found, other times they could. But in any case, the rules are considered absolute. These things you must not do. What sort of thing? Well, uh, it depends on the level of civilization. Who morality is the primitive. It's the only kind I They fuck you up, your mum and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had, and add some extra, just for you. But they were fucked up in their turn, by fools in old-style hats and coats, who half the time were soppy stern, and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as Get early out. as you can, as Get early as you can, as and don't have any kids. Don't have any kids. Always looking around. But uh, those are sort of taboos from what we, I suppose, consider primitive societies. What about our own? Well, her own uh, morality is just as full of taboos. There are all sorts of things. Uh, well, uh, even in the most august things, uh, there is one uh, sin definitely recognized to be a sin which I have never committed. It says thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox. Now I never have, but uh, I don't uh, quite see what harm I should do if I did. Yes, but what about more sort of matter of fact or every day?
if you don't believe in religion and you don't, and if you don't on the whole think much of the assorted rules thrown up by taboo morality, do you believe in any system of ethics? Yes, but it's very difficult to separate ethics altogether from politics. Uh, ethics, it seems to me, arises in this way. Uh, a man is inclined to do something which benefits him and harms his neighbor. Well, uh, if it harms a good many of his neighbors, they will uh, combine together and say, look, uh, we don't like this sort of thing. We will see to it that it doesn't benefit the man. And that leads to the criminal law, which is uh, perfectly rational. It's a method of harmonizing the general and private interests. But uh, isn't it though rather inconvenient if everybody goes about uh, with his own kind of private system of ethics instead of accepting a general one? It would be if that were so, but in fact they're not so private as all that because, uh, as I was saying a moment ago, they get embodied in the criminal law and apart from the criminal law, in public approval and disapproval. People don't like to incur public disapproval and in that way
think then that if everything that anybody wanted to write in an obscene nature were to be published, this in fact would not increase people's interest at all. I think it would diminish it. I think, uh, suppose for instance, the filthy postcards were permitted. I think for the first year or two, there would be great demand for them, and then people would get bored and nobody would want them again. And this would apply to writings and so on as well? I think so. Within the limits of what is sensible, I mean, if it was a fine piece of art, a fine piece of work, people would read it, but not to, because it was pornographic. To come back to the basis of what we've been talking about, the unthinking rules to do morality, what harm do you think they do? Well, they do two different sorts of harm. Let's say those of them which are not rationally justifiable. What sort of harm is that they are usually ancient and come down from a different sort of society from that in which we live, where really a different ethic was appropriate, and very often they're not at all appropriate in modern times. I think that applies in particular to artificial insemination, which is a thing that the moralists of the past hadn't thought of. Yes, who was a very eminent uh, 
Yeah. Right not fanaticism at times provide a kind of mainspring for good actions. It provides a mainspring for actions, all right. But I can't think of any instance in history where it's provided to mainspring for good actions. Always, I think, for bad ones. Because it is partial, because it almost inevitably involves some kind of hatred. You hate the people who don't share your fanaticism. It's uh, almost inevitable. But then, if it gets taken over by uh, economic considerations, say, that like the Crusades, then fanaticism disappears and perhaps does no harm. Well, I don't know. I, I can't uh, think of any good that the Crusades did. The Crusades had, of course, two uh, different streams in them, a fanatical stream and an economic stream. The economic thing was very strong indeed, but the, it wouldn't have worked without the fanaticism. The fanaticism provided the troops and the economic motive the generals, <laughs> roughly speaking. <laughs> But what part would you say that witchcraft has played in fanaticism? Oh, uh, witchcraft played a terrible, terrible part, uh, especially uh, from uh, oh, from about 1450 to about uh, 1600, a little longer than 1600. Uh, quite terrible part. There was a work called uh, The Hammer of Female Malefactors, which was by an eminent ecclesiastic and uh, inspired uh, the most mad profusion of witch hunts, which the people themselves believed. Uh, I think it's very likely that Joan of Arc believed she was a witch. Certainly a great many people condemned as witches did believe they were witches. And, uh, there was an enormous spread of cruelty. Now, uh, Sir Thomas Brown, you would say, when you read his works, he seems like a very humane and cultivated person. But he uh, actually took part in the trials of witches on the side of the prosecution. And he said that to, to deny witchcraft is a form of atheism. Because after all, the Bible says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Therefore, if you don't think it's right to burn them, you think witches, you must be disbelieving the Bible, and there will be an atheist. But how is it that quite sane people, on the surface at any rate, can be fanatical? Well, sanity is a relative term. Uh, very, very few people are sane all through. Almost everybody has corners where they are made. I remember once I was motoring in California on a very, very wet day, and we picked up a pedestrian and he went through. And he invaded against all kinds of race prejudice. He said it was the most dreadful thing. I know they agreed with him. Then somebody mentioned the Philippines, and he said, All Filipinos are vile. <laughs> well, you see, he had that little corner of it, said he. But why do you attach so much importance to that subject? Because a very great part of the evils of the world is suffering are uh, due to fanaticism. A very, very great part uh, always has been so, and it's worse in the present day than it's ever been before. I don't think fanaticism is more prevalent, but it is doing more harm than it has ever done before in human history. Can you elaborate? Yes, certainly. It deserves to be elaborated. I think that the east-west tension, which is threatening us all in every fashion, is mainly due to political belief in communism or anti-communism, as the case may be. Both sides believe their own creed too strongly. They believe it in the way that I define as fanatical, and they think that is to say that the prevention of what they regard as wicked on the other side is more important, even than the continued existence of the human race, that is fanatical, and it is that fanaticism which is threatening the soul, and it exists on both sides. What's your definition of toleration? Toleration consists in where it varies according to what 
formation of opinion. If it's really known, it consists in not punishing any kind of opinion.
shortly before five o'clock this morning that it became clear the UK had taken the historic decision to leave. The country has just taken part in a giant democratic exercise. Well done everybody. Really well done. It's nice to have a percent. It's your fault, Jeremy. It's your fault. It's your fault. When are you resigning? It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. I had a police friend in tears because you can now say the decision taken in 1975 by this country to join the common market has been reversed by this referendum to leave the EU. And you failed considerably. And now I have Polish people. It's a victory. Broadly, no, it was decent. Well, it was it's a victory That's against it the big merchant it banks, it's against the big businesses, and against platform. big politics. The On the way the here, British people have made a very clear out. decision proud. to and take a like, different oh, oh, path. We not proud, but and as such, I think the country <laughs> requires fresh leadership to take it in this direction. It is vital to stress that there is now no need for haste and indeed as the Prime Minister has just said, nothing will change over the short term except that work will have to begin on how to give effect to the people and to extricate this country from the supranational system. This does not mean that the United Kingdom will be in any way less united. Are you going to support someone who is on the leave, who was on the leave campaign? The Scottish Parliament should have the right to call in an election referendum if there is a significant and material change in circumstances that have been in 2015, such as Scotland being taken out of the United States. Scotland does now face a prospect. It is a significant and material change in circumstances. I fought this campaign but, but in the only way I know how, got and which is to say directly and passionately what I think and feel, head, heart and soul. I held nothing back. I was absolutely clear about my belief that Britain is stronger, safer and better off inside the European Union. And I made clear the referendum was about this and this alone. Not the future of any single politician, including myself. But the British people have made a very clear decision to take a different path. And as such, I think the country requires fresh leadership to take it in this direction. I will do everything I can as Prime Minister to steady the ship over the coming weeks and months. But I do not think it would be right for me to try to be the captain steers our country to its next destination. This is not a decision I've taken lightly, but I do believe it's in the national interest to have a period of stability and then the new leadership required. There is no need for a precise timetable today, but in my view we should aim to have a new Prime Minister in place by the start of the Conservative Party conference in October. To leave the European Union, and I will go to Parliament well, I have to say, that the In voting to leave now, the EU, it is vital to stress so there is now no need for haste. And indeed, as the Prime Minister has just said, 
Nothing will change over the short term, except that work will have to begin on how to affect the will of the people and to exculpate this country. Why are you sending 10 billion a year debt to Brussels? Well, just think, well, just look at the Shortly before 5 o'clock this morning, it became clear the UK had taken the historic decision to leave the country. And you're in denial of democratic exercise. Well done, everybody. Really well done. With many any people as possible to cross the Mediterranean into the European Union. Thank you. After a great deal of effort, I do feel stupid and dangerous. I will be advocating. But the biggest problem you've got, and the reason, on the basis of the main reason, the United Kingdom voted the way that it did, is that you have, by stealth, strayed now into the expression of what is a simple. The British or the rest of the peoples, the peoples of Europe to drag the United Kingdom out You have of imposed the upon them a political union. Drag the Queen in. You have imposed upon France, them a political Poland union. And, and when We're the people in 2005 in the Netherlands and France back, yeah. voted straight against back all my life. I just think that we're, we're losing identity. You're you suddenly just going to get swallowed up and then puzzled on the EU. Through the back door. And UK is going to be in the back of the queue. The American yeah. president is coming up to say, Love it. Well, last it was, was a remarkable result. It was indeed a seismic result. Not just the British politics, the European politics, and perhaps even the global politics, too. Because what the little people did, what the old people did, what the people who have been oppressed over the last few years, and seen their living standards go down, they rejected. Oh, really? And you weren't planning to report it, were you? No, no. And you 
Um, I literally was six feet shy. There were people walking past. I literally was six feet shy. There were people walking past. And I, I wasn't going to pause it, so I just said, the police are so busy. Here's what I'm going to pause it. So I just said, you want to play. And it was people in social networks who want to play. And it was people in social networks. And so I did, because the police are absolutely fantastic now. So I did. And anyone who thinks the police do not take what is the hell they want to do, seriously. Because they said that uh, the Jews killed Christ, and so it gave them a justification for hating the Jews. I've no doubt there really were economic motives, but uh, that was the justification. Why do you think people do get seized in large numbers with fanaticism? Well, it's partly that uh, it gives you a cozy feeling of cooperation. A fanatical group altogether have a comfortable feeling that they're all friends of each other. Uh, they're all very much excited about the same thing. Uh, you can see it in any uh, uh, political party. There's always a fringe of fanatics in any political party. And they feel awfully cosy with each other. And when that is spread about and is combined with a propensity to hate some other group,